expert today, um, we have a guest, Crystal. He will be taking over uh, the webinar and share his knowledge on financial projections. Uh, but just before we dive into the subject, uh, just keep your eyes focused because I'll be playing a, a quick video on the Stuclap Center services. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. It's the light bulb moment from your first big idea. It's the decision to set out on a new path. It's the realization that entrepreneurship starts with a spark, and that spark starts here. At the Stu Clark Center, we're here to nurture your ideas and help spark your entrepreneurial spirit. How? How about competitive opportunities to free your inner entrepreneur? Advice from venture coaches who have walked the walk. Or some of the best networking events you'll find on campus. You'll find it all right here. By focusing on education, awareness, community, coaching, and connection, we build strong relationships with our students and do everything we can to help them on their journey to self-starting. At the Stu Clark Center, we thrive when you thrive. No idea is too big or too small. The Stu Clark Center is your one-stop shop for everything you need to start your journey. So why not start today? Perfect. Why not start today? And my name is Karin. I am the venture coach here at the Stu Clark Center for Entrepreneurship. And my role is to help you uh, whether you are just curious about entrepreneurship or you've started your business or you're even thinking of scaling, uh, I'm the person you should go to. Uh, we, we have a platform here available for all students to be able to book a, a meeting with me. And this is a little bit of my background. Um, I am an entrepreneur myself and I've also been working as a financial officer for the World Trade Center Winnipeg and a financial analyst for CBC Radio Canada. So I have uh, a little bit of experience with accounting, finances, which is why I'm so excited today because the topic is about financial projections. And uh, yes, I operate my own business. Uh, I'm working on different, uh, different ventures for myself. And I'm not alone. We have a wonderful team here at the Stu Clark Center. We have our director, Debra Jonasson Young, Lindsay, uh, our marketing coordinator, Amy, our program coordinator, she's actually in charge of the competition. So if you have any questions, um, she's the person to go to. Actually, the deadline for the business plan is March 4th. So perfect timing for you to finish that and then send us the consistent document. And we have Belinda, um, our office administrator. We are here to help you. We are here to serve you. And uh, any question you may have, feel free to, to contact us one of us and we'll be glad to help you out. Um, as I mentioned, it's very easy to book a meeting with me. Um, you can go on our website and do so through the Startup Tree platform. We have a, a beautiful lineup for the rest of the, of the winter. I know it's cold, but just keep the excitement going. Uh, we actually have uh, um, uh, Michelle Romano for one of our, as a, as a, as a guest, speaker for the event that we're having during the competition. So go right now, register if you haven't done so. Uh, we have a few webinars as well planned for March and April 6th. So feel free to go on the website and uh, register, get yourself ready to attend those events. <laughs> and uh, with no further ado, we're gonna dive into the subject. I will just quickly introduce you, uh, Mr. Christos, who is here with us to provide his, to share his knowledge on financial projections. Uh, but just a quick background on Christo. He is very passionate about helping entrepreneurs and creators bring their ideas to life. He was also uh, one of the venture coach here at the Stu Clark Center. So uh, it's a welcome back home uh, for him today. Uh, he, he was also a former president for the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization of Manitoba, the CEO, and he joined a management consulting firm dedicated to help me, helping small business owners and entrepreneurs raise capital and launch their new businesses. 
uh, now is the operations manager at Kit Booster, uh, a subsidy of um, um, Bold, uh, Bold Commerce, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, with no further ado, Crystal, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Let me steal the screen from you if I could. Absolutely. Beautiful. Share. Awesome. Can you guys see my screen? Thumbs up, anyone? Oh, beautiful. Yep. Janet, you're the only person that has your screen on, so I feel like I'm going to be talking to you the whole time because I can't see anyone else. But uh, awesome. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Corinne, for the introduction. So uh, I'm here to talk about financial forecasting today, and uh, I've done a lot of work with the center in the past. So uh, thanks for everyone for coming. I'm a huge fan of the center and everything that they do. And uh, yeah, great to see so many folks here. I wasn't sure what to expect, but it looks like we've got 20 plus. So awesome. Okay. Let me. So goals and outcomes for today's webinar. Uh, I thought we would start with me just going through briefly the different sources of funding. And I know that that's not specific to financial forecasting, but I think it's important to understand the different types of funding sources because depending on which funding source you're after will depend on or will dictate how you want to build your financial forecast. So the way you would appease to a bank is very different than the way you'd want to present to say a venture capital firm. So we'll start with introducing the different funds of sort or sources of funding and then we'll jump into the do's and don'ts and the steps to create a financial forecast, um, which will be the second half and kind of the meat and potatoes of everything. And then at the end, I definitely wanna open the floor for questions. We've got a relatively small group, so definitely would happy to finish up earlier and then just hammer out the questions you guys are specifically looking for. What will not be covered in today's webinar is I'm not gonna go through on Excel how to build these. So most financial projections are built in Excel or G Sheets. I'm not gonna sit here and make you guys watch me uh, put in formulas and that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm not gonna really outline how, to, how the financial statements work. I mean, that's a whole course in itself. Um, but this is the bowling emoji here. I'm setting up the pins for Corinne to knock them down and that you guys are definitely welcome to set up a meeting with a venture coach who can walk you through these two things, um, especially Corinne having a background in accounting, something that I don't have, uh, should be able to speak better to how the financial statements work with each other and, and how to build them out specific to your business because every business, it looks very different. Um, so yeah, book with a venture coach, uh, you won't regret it. So thank you, Corinne, for introducing me. I didn't know you were gonna do that. Uh, so there is gonna be some replication here, um, but just a little bit about me. On the personal side, I'm a huge F1 fan. I'm on Team Hamilton this year. So if there's any other Formula One fans, uh, that is my thing right now. My nickname is Cheese Toast, Christos Cheese Toast. Uh, so uh, feel free to call me that. That's what most of my friends call me. I'm from Brandon, uh, but most of my family is uh, still in Greece. So that's a little bit about me on the personal side. On the professional side, I grew up in Brandon in a small family business. So my family owns a small pizzeria in Brandon. Uh, so I've been exposed to entrepreneurship a long time. The first business I ran was in my first year of university. So 2009, I'm uh, getting old, uh, but a uh, painting business. Um, ran a team of eights and we did a couple hundred grand in one summer. Uh, sales, not profits. I wish I was profits. Uh, but that was my first kind of entrepreneurial journey. My second was a software company uh, called Quotes. Me and a buddy started. Essentially what it was was what Giphy is today or Jiffy, um, except we had sound in the small clips. So small uh, clips uh, for communication purposes. Um, unfortunately, we missed the mark. We should have took the audio out because we got in trouble with copyright and that kind of thing. And uh, now you guys have Giphy. So I was one feature short of a breakthrough there. After that, as Corinne said, I moved on to Redleaf Capital uh, upon graduating. And uh, that's a management consulting firm specializing in raising capital for small and medium sized businesses. So when I'm talking about you know, financial forecasting, what investors look at, in this role here, I've built hundreds of business plans, sat through 
hundreds of investor pitches, bank meetings, that kind of stuff. So this is kind of the foundation from which I'm speaking from. Uh, after three, four years at Redleaf, I moved to Bold, uh, uh, Bold Commerce. When I joined the company, they were the fastest growing company, fastest growing startup in Manitoba and the 12th fastest in all of Canada. So I was kind of at that rocket ship phase I got to join. And I was part of the deal team that uh, raised the $35 million that you guys probably had heard about uh, Winnipeg company raising a large amount of cash. Uh, so that came with a pile of investor meetings, a pile of financial forecasting, pitch decks, all that kind of stuff. So there's a bit of that uh, software side that I know a bit about as well. And then as of now, I oversee a subsidiary of Bold, which is called Kick Booster, and we specialize in crowdfunding. And so that is an alternative means of raising capital, which I won't get in too much to today, but in the question period, if you guys want to have me with anything on crowdfunding, uh, I can speak a little bit to that. So that's enough about me. Um, let's talk about the types of fundraising, the sources of capital that is out there. So there's a lot of means of raising capital for your business. Um, these are the primary ones. And the two that I'm gonna dive deepest into today are debt and equity. So those are the main forms of raising capital. There's also crowdfunding. There's your classic bootstrapping. And then of course, grants, um, any excess cash through grants. There's some awesome programs in Manitoba. I'll outline a few, but these are kind of the five core ones that are available in Canada. So let's start with debt. So what is debt? Debt is actually the best, in my opinion, form of capital raising. It's actually the cheapest. So you don't hear about it in the news, you know, the tech crunch and all those guys aren't covering a big debt financings uh, because they're not sexy, but debt is actually the cheapest form of capital that's available. <clears throat> so what is debt? Debt is money given to a business that is repaid over a specified period of time, um, typically with the addition of interest payments. So the bank gives you cash uh, and says, you just have to pay this cash back over X period of time. And while you pay it back, you also have to give us a fee. Um, for borrowing our cash and that fee is called an interest payment. So that's uh, similar to how a mortgage works with uh, buying a house or a credit card works. Um, those are all forms of debt. The three sources or providers of debt capital are traditional banks, credit unions, or government banks. Traditional banks are typically the cheapest form of debt. And when I say cheapest, I mean they have the lowest interest rates typically. The challenge with traditional banks, however, is that they like to loan against assets. So for example, if you're starting a restaurant or a construction company that has a lot of assets, a lot of equipment, traditional banks are more likely to lend to you because they like lending against assets. And the reason they like lending against assets is if you don't pay them back, if you're not paying them their cash and uh, interest payments, they're happy to show up and take your building or take your piece of equipment and then they can sell it and get their money back. They're less inclined to lend against things like paying funds for paying wages, marketing, you know, software development, that kind of stuff, because it's not something that they can take and sell. Um, so banks are the cheapest. Their interest rates typically range from three to 5%, um, depending on the market. Right now, the market's really good for loans, um, but they typically want assets. So it's much harder to get if you're, say, in a software, or a software company or something like that. Credit unions are very similar to traditional banks in that they like to lend against assets, but they're willing to take on a little bit more risk. So I've seen a lot of startups apply for a traditional bank loan, get declined, but then actually uh, are successful with a credit, credit union. But the credit union for taking on the additional risk typically has a slightly higher interest rate. Uh, so if a traditional bank is four to three to 5%, uh, credit union would be five to 7%, for example. And then the last one is the government banks. So uh, in Canada or here, it's uh, the BDC. The BDC is fantastic for startups. So they, unlike traditional banks and credit unions, are more comfortable with lending against um, non-assets. So they will fund things like uh, startup costs, wages, marketing materials, et cetera, et cetera. They do require you to jump through a lot of, I, I wouldn't say red tape, but a very comprehensive business plan, a lot of meetings to outline uh, what you're doing with the funds and, and why you'll be successful, et cetera. And they're very heavy on financial forecasts. So that's why we're here today. Uh, but yeah, they are a great place to start. Their rates, obviously, if they're taking on that additional uh, risk, 
They uh, charge a much higher interest rate, typically seven to 10%. I've seen them go even higher, um, but they are a great source if you can't get funding from traditional banks. So the pros of debt, you don't lose any ownership. So you'll see on the next slide, if you are to raise funds from equity, you lose a piece of your company, you're actually selling ownership. Um, and with that comes a whole host of things. The banks, honestly, they don't want they don't have any interest in taking ownership of your company they don't want to boss you around they're not trying to oust founders they simply just want you to pay back their money with the interest rate so that's a low pressure typically low risk uh, scenario assuming that you your business is profitable and able to make those payments the cons is like we said it's difficult to raise funds uh, unless you don't have physical assets through debt so banks aren't typically funding software companies that kind of thing and there is an impact on cash flow, meaning, you know, when you raise money through equity, that's cash in your bank account, you don't have to give it back. Whereas with the bank every month or every quarter, whatever your banking setup is, that's cash out of your bank, and you have to make those payments. And there's a risk with that, especially in the earlier part of your startup. If you don't, you know, aren't making sales yet, or you're still in your setup phase, you make sure you have to make sure you budget to make those payments. So there is a cash flow impact. So that's debt funding. Equity funding, the other more popular, more sexy one that you probably hear about in the news a little bit more is equity funding. So these uh, equity funding is the sale of shares in your company in exchange for funds. So typically how this works is you indicate that you're uh, selling shares in your company, whether in the private or if you guys have probably heard of the public markets and uh, based on a valuation, you can sell ownership in your company in exchange for cash. <clears throat> so that cash goes directly into the business, can be used for business operations. The two primary types of equity investors are angel investors and venture capital firms. Angel investors are typically um, individuals or entities that are open to investing early, early in the process. A lot of times they'll invest even when your idea is in the idea stage or you're very early in the prototyping process, they're willing to invest money um, because they have a high tolerance for risk. However, in exchange for that high tolerance for risk, they typically want a higher upside or a higher return on that investment. So a lot of times that could be 20, 30, even 51% of your company in exchange for their money because they know without your money, you know, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting started and getting this thing off the ground. So high risk, high reward. Angel investors are typically coming to that early phase. Uh, the other option is venture capital firms. They come in typically a little later in the process. So <clears throat> this is when you have your prototype set up, maybe you have your first customers, maybe you have some cash flow rolling and you want to add fuel to that fire. You want to grow faster. Venture capital firms typically will come in assess the product, assess that you've got success in the market, and then they'll fuel your growth. Um, so they're a little bit later stage. Because they're not taking on as much risk as, say, an angel, they're typically not going for a massive part of your company because you've already proven it works or you have some traction. So they're willing to go in at, uh, at a less percentage, typically. Obviously, if you've seen Dragon's Den and, and some of those shows, you know that can range wi uh, widely. Uh, but in general, they're taking on less risk, so they, they require less investment return. In Manitoba, really the only angel group that I'm aware of is uh, the Manitoba Knights. Um, but there's tons of angel groups all over Canada, especially in Toronto, um, that you can reach out to, especially in this digital world. They're taking pitches uh, remotely all the time. And then also there's accredited investors. Basically what that is, is a wealthy individual who uh, is certified to invest in startups. Um, so, you know, doctors, uh, well, I shouldn't say that all sorts of different professions can invest as an accredited investor. And then venture capital firms, not a ton in Winnipeg, uh, but there's tons of VC firms all over Canada, around 13, Whitecap and Omers, the three I listed, just because I know they've invested in Winnipeg companies in the past. So, but there's tons of them out there. All, some of them have their own niches, that kind of thing. So look for the right VC for you. Pros of raising capital through equity, <clears throat> no interest payments. Uh, so you don't have to make those monthly payments. The money that's coming to the company is to be used for the company, whatever it, it needs. And the other big benefit is you can gain a strategic partner. So for example, uh, I know Bold, their first capital raise was with round 13. 
And Route 13's founder is Bruce Croxton, who's actually had successful ex exits in the software space. So not only did we obtain his capital, but we obtained you know, expertise in someone who's been in the software space and who's actually successfully exited in the, in the software space. So it's a means of gaining partners as well, as well not just money, unlike the banks. But the biggest con is uh, you give up ownership. So unlike the banks who don't care about ownership, you are giving a piece of your hard earned company away uh, to someone else. And with that comes a partner and with that comes a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure. So uh, when you have somebody else looking over your shoulder, expecting growth, expecting return on their investment, um, that comes with pressure, expectations around growth, profits, et cetera. So um, it's definitely not for everybody when compared to the banks in terms of a means of raising capital. So those are the two big ones, debt and equity. I'll fly through the other ones. Uh, the other one is crowdfunding. Um, so this is a process of raising funds from a large number of, oh wait, uh, raising funds from a large number of small investments. So instead of one VC giving you one big check uh, for a million dollars, you get that same a million dollars from hundreds if not thousands of smaller checks uh, from people in the crowd. Um, so there's a couple uh, types, equity-based, debt-based, rewards-based is probably the most popular one. I'm sure you guys have heard of Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Those are all different types of uh, crowdfunding. And the pros of using crowdfunding is you actually gain like thousands, hundreds, if not thousands of brand advocates. So once you're an investor in a company um, and your financial return is based on their success, you better believe that they're going to be big advocates of your brand. So imagine having thousands of founders all telling their friends and, and driving traffic to your site, et cetera. So that's a huge pro of going through crowdfunding. The downside is it's very time consuming and very expensive, not only to run the crowdfunding process, but to manage all those relationships with thousands of investors, reporting your financial performance, doing votes, et cetera. Uh, so it's something to be aware of that it's quite time consuming. And the last one outside of grants is bootstrapping. I think this is overlooked. And for everyone here is probably interested in raising capital. There is nothing wrong with bootstrapping. So what bootstrapping is funding growth through operating profits rather than external investment. Again, especially with the tech scene nowadays, there's a lot of excitement and news around raising capital and growing super, super quick. Um, but there's nothing wrong with building a business and using profits to fuel that growth rather than taking external investment. So you sell one pizza and with the profits, you make two more, you sell those with the profits, you make four, et cetera, et cetera. And you grow your business organically. Um, lots of pros, no interest payments, no giving up ownership. You can control your growth. You don't have people telling you what to do. It's easy on your cash flow. Uh, it's typically a great way to go. The biggest con is you're growing slower. So if you're in an industry where speed to market is important which is typical in the software industry you know first one there to grab market share has a strong advantage um, or it's an innovative product that you don't want people copying and beating you to the market that's typically where growth is preferred but outside of that you know your standard companies bootstrapping is always a great option and of course any grant funding you can get is a bonus so there's some awesome grant programs here in manitoba and canada those first two, Shred and IRAP, are innovation-driven uh, grants. I've applied and successfully received funding for both of them. They're awesome people to work with. Lots of, again, financial forecasting, business planning that you have to do, uh, but they're definitely great programs to work with. My tax helps fund um, specialized uh, labor and people with good skill sets, um, and every industry has industry-specific grants, so just uh, a lot of work to get them, but they're definitely worth it. So which way do I go? There's so many funding sources. That's the magic question, right? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer. It depends. It depends on your business. It depends on your risk tolerance. If you're, uh, if you're starting a business that has a ton of capital assets um, and you're not looking for strategic partner and you want to keep your cash flow lean and mean, you know, debt might be the best option. If you're in an industry where speed to the market is important and imperative, you want to raise capital and grow as fast as you can. If there's a long development cycle uh, between when you launch and say you're developing an app for eight months before it launches, you're probably going to want to raise capital through equity investing, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so it depends. But one thing that I think people forget is you can have a mix. And I think that's actually important to consider is, you know, having some debt um, as well as some equity, as well as, you know, making sure you get to profitability quick enough to use operating profits is always a smart play. And uh, you should consider having a balance of those different cash uh, injections uh, to make sure that you're growing uh, effectively and managing your risk. Any questions? Maybe I know we're a smaller group. Maybe we can open it up for questions now, or do you want me to go right to the end, Corinne? I know that's a lot of information to digest. Yeah, like I'm not seeing any questions yet, but yeah, we have, I mean, it's up to you if you have more content or if you want I got more content, in. yeah. Okay, I'll keep rolling. But if anyone okay. has questions, <laughs> okay. note it down. And uh... Oh, so I had one more slide. What are they looking for? I, I think I talked on this a bit, but debt providers are just wanting to make sure that you guys make enough cash flow to make your loan payments. That's it. They don't have any interest in if you grow, if you shrink, if you anything. They just want to make sure you're profitable enough to make your payments. Equity investors are looking for growth. They're looking for a return on their investment. So that's why I wanted to start with this section because it's important to know if you're doing financial forecasting for a bank, your focus is to show that you have the available cash flow to make their payments, nothing else. Whereas with an equity investor, you're showing growth or you're showing how they're going to make money on their investment. So those are kind of things I want you to keep in mind as we go through the next sections. Oh, how do we do that? Financial forecasts. There you go. Okay, finally, we're at financial forecasting. So what is financial forecasting? Financial forecasting is the process of projecting future financial performance based on well-researched and defendable assumptions. So that's the key part, defendable assumptions. Um, so a lot of people will just go and pull numbers out of the air and say, I'm gonna grow at 12% a year and I'm gonna hit 300K at the end of year one and 700K at the end of year two. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of business plans where numbers are being pulled out of the hat. And I can tell you right now, as soon as investors ask, where did you get that number? If you don't have a defendable answer based on an assumption or logic, they're gonna stop listening to you. They're going to discredit all your hard work because they don't have trust in the numbers that you're providing. So these four steps are gonna kind of outline the process of building defendable assumptions and defendable numbers so that when you're in those presentations with a VC, with a bank, with an angel investor, you can speak to those. Hi, so, hi Crystal, sorry, I yeah. think there's uh, some questions. Yes, thank you. There. Please do. Uh, we have some questions written in the chat, so if you go answer this question. Oh boy, okay. Um, sorry, we're just giving the questions uh, 15 minutes so that everyone gets to have the question and then we're gonna go through the question. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and then I will read every question and then and Crystal will be able to answer each of them. Just right, to avoid interruptions and keep everyone focused for the way. Yeah, sorry about that. That was my fault that yeah. I asked for oh, questions. No, that's fine. We'll wait for okay. question time, no problem. Perfect. I'll, I'll make yes. sure to get to you. If I don't get to them all, uh, I'll definitely circle back with you guys after. Perfect. Uh, okay, so step one <laughs> is do your industry research. So. I know that sounds kind of basic, but it's actually by far the most important step because if you can't, if you don't understand the industry in which you're acting in, especially if you're pitching to VCs that do know the industry fairly well, and that's common because a lot of these VC firms are invest in niches, um, you, you will never raise capital from banks, from VCs, anyone. So uh, these are just a few examples, but there's, there's dozens of things that you can research. Uh, the total addressable market's a big one. So the uh, total addressable market is how big is the potential market that you can generate revenue from? You wouldn't believe how many times I'd see someone, uh, you know, in our first year, we are going to have 50,000 users. But then when you look at the market, there's only 100,000 users there. And it's not realistic for someone to have 50% of the market in their first year. Or I've even seen examples where someone's, we're going to have, you know, 50,000 users at the, uh, at the end of year one. And the market only has 30,000 users available. And it's like, okay, you've clearly not done your research. 
Um, so that's that's a big one. Know how big your market is and then be realistic with how much market can you capture in that first year, in that second year. Of, oftentimes it's less than a percentage of the entire market. So if you think about a construction company, a restaurant, anything in Winnipeg, you're not going to have more than 1% uh, in your first year, maybe 2% if you're crazy, crazy good. So something to think about. And again, if you're talking to a bank like the BDC, they, they invest in restaurants every day. They hear pitches, probably dozens of them a day or a week. They're going to know the market really well. So you need to know it too. Uh, average financial performance. So this is one a lot of people don't think is uh, easy to find. It's actually incredibly easy to find for most industries. And I thought I'd actually show you guys um, how to find. So uh, if you guys go to, um, let's see here. If you guys go to Industry Canada, you just Google Industry Canada, um, create a report. Uh, this top search result, you guys can see my screen, eh? Thumbs up. Awesome. This top report here, create a report. This actually is the government uh, produced financial statements for pretty much any industry that you can think of. Uh, you can search by Canada or Manitoba. Um, I usually go rev search by uh, not percentages, but by dollars. And then you can actually browse pretty much any industry you can think of. Uh, construction, click search here, pretty much any construction, highways, foundation construction, framing, masonry. Uh, if we go to, let's go to residential construction. They'll actually generate a report of the average earnings, uh, profit and losses and cash flows <coughs> for companies under that term that are registered in the government. So for example, uh, companies uh, have an average revenue in this industry of $624,000. On the high end, on average, they make $1.8 million. So that's super, super impactful for you guys to know. If you're starting a residential construction company and you go and say, I'm going to make $6 million in your first year, you know, someone's going to say that outperforms the top 25% of construction companies in Manitoba. That's fine if you still believe you can do it but you have to explain why you're gonna be four to five times better than the average top 25% uh, of the industry. Another cool thing to look at is, you know, percentages of costs against for revenue. So on average construction companies, about 10% of their revenue is in wages. So you can see $60,000 60, uh, on, $624,000 is wages. Purchases, materials, that kind of thing is about half uh, of all their revenue is into wood, labor, nails, all that kind of stuff. So again, when your guys are building your projections, if you're showing that your cost purchases and materials and subcontractors is only 10% of your revenue, you know, investors are gonna ask, how are you able to do that? How are you able to produce a residential building with half the equipment expenses of materials than the industry average. And hey, it may be true, but you have to be ready to explain how you're doing it or how, you, how, you, how that's possible. So there's a lot of cool stuff in here, labor, um, repairs and maintenance on equipment, you know, average rent cost for a facility to, to house a construction company, et cetera, advertising and promotion, et cetera. So these are a good starting point for you to build financials, build projections, et cetera. And they've got pretty much every industry that is imaginable with the exception of if you're doing something completely brand new or out of the box. Go back to my slideshow. Uh, so that's Industry Canada. If you get, if you Google Industry Canada Creator Report, that's how you get to that. <clears throat> Growth rate's another one. Um, you know, if you're saying you're growing at 20% when the average industry is 10%, again, may be true, but you just have to explain how you're doing that. How are you able to grow double the speed of the industry? Seasonality, conduct your own research, knowing your competitors is, is key. You know, what are they pricing things at? How are you gonna be able to beat them, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are all questions that the venture capitalists or banks are gonna to wanna to know. How did you get to this number? How did you pick the price for your pizza to be $32? Why is it double the price of your competitors? Is it double the quality? Is it your, your raw materials are more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to know those things. 
lots of resources. I talked about the Industry Canada report. There's lots of association websites uh, that publish stats, publish financial information on the industry. So definitely look for those depending on what industry you're in. I'm really, really excited to call this one out. So you guys as U of M students have access to this thing called the U of M libraries. It's an online portal and the U of M actually subscribes to some of the biggest databases in the world. I'm super sad that I didn't find out about this to my last year in university. The amount of stuff that they have in that portal is just insanity. And I mean that, I mean like, I almost enrolled back in university, took a couple of classes just to get access to this because it would honestly be worth whatever the class cost for me to have access to this amount of information. So leverage this when you can. Ibis World, they have a subscription. That's thousands of dollars a month subscription. Uh, that the U of M pays for you guys. Uh, that has industry information, growth rates, average financial projections, uh, keys like SWOT analysis, all, everything that you can imagine is in there. First industry reports, uh, they do, it's more on the US side, uh, but they do unbelievable 50 page studies on pretty much every industry you can imagine and they do them every quarter. So you can, you know, you're not looking at 2016 data, you're looking at like probably two months ago data. Um, so really great resource. I urge you guys, I wish I could show you, but I don't have access anymore. Uh, but that's something maybe you could, uh, Corinne, if you, do, if you don't have access, uh, we'll, we'll make sure you get set up with that so you can walk students through that because it's fantastic. All right, that's step one, do your industry research. Okay, now you know your industry inside and out. You know the growth rates, you know the financials, you know what your competitors are doing. The second step is to choose your assumption set. So now you're about to build your financial projections. You need to make decisions on what are all the impacting factors that are gonna drive your financial numbers. So these are, again, just a couple of examples, but <clears throat> for example, the one I see people forget all the time is the pre-launch period that, you know, hey, the day I sign the lease for my new restaurant, I'm gonna start making money. Well, no, that's not realistic. There's usually a gap where you gotta install your equipment, hire your staff, get them all trained up, what, what is that period between when you start paying that lease payment and when you first start generating income? Because you have to find a way to pay, pay your rent costs during that period. Um, cost to build is another uh, one that people you know, don't give enough thought to. So if you're selling pizzas, how much does that pizza cost? You know, If you take into consideration the dough, the tomatoes, mushrooms, pepperoni, all that stuff, you know, if you're selling it for $13, but it actually costs you $14 to make the pizza, you know, that's a major problem. So these are things that you have to think about. Growth rate's a big one. You know, how much are you paying your staff? Seasonality is a big one I see people miss. They kind of just show growth every single month. Grow, 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 grow. That's not how the real world works. I mean, especially in Manitoba, you know, a lot of businesses shut down in winter or are much, much slower in winter. You think of a painting company, you go crazy in the summer and then zero in the winter, crazy in the summer, zero in the winter kind of thing. Um, so that's something that especially the banks want to see because if you, you know, can pay their loan payments in the good times and the good months, but if you don't have the cash flow to pay their loan payments in your slow months, that's going to cause a uh, area of concern for them. So you want to consider a seasonality. So again, these are just a few examples uh, of things to consider, but your every industry will have its own set of assumptions or sets of financial drivers. So I did a couple example ones for you. <clears throat> so this is a pizzeria coming from the pizza game. I uh, wanted to show you this. So pre-launch period, three months from start of the lease to install equipment. How did I get that assumption? Again, if the investor asks, where did you get that number? Why three months? Well, I got a quote from the vendor that's going to install the equipment. They say they can do it in two and a half months. I added a half month to be safe. That is a valid explanation on that assumption. And the investor will go, oh, okay, that's cool that you thought that through and you've actually got that answer. Price of your product, large, medium, small. <clears throat> Where did you come up with these numbers? Well, they're 5% above my competition because I'm branding myself as a premium product in the market as well as it's giving me a 23% uh, cost of goods, which means that I'm gonna have, oh boy, let's challenge my math here, 77% uh, profit margin on a per unit basis, which is sustainable for me to cover the rest of my costs. Okay, those are good assumptions. They've shown that you've thought them through. Monthly growth rate, 
average of 2% per month. That is the industry standard. I've got that from four different sources, one on IBIS World, uh, one on uh, Manitoba Industry, uh, Industry Canada. Okay, that's a descent defendable assumption. So as you can see, as you go through these, every time an investor asks you a question about your numbers, you can defend it with logical responses. And what does that do for you? It allows you to be aggressive with your fi financial forecasting. If you can justify every single number that you're putting up there and they're not pulled out of the air, you're gaining the trust of the investor, you're showing you know your stuff, and you know you can be more aggressive because it's backed by not just pulling stuff out of the air, but by actual facts or logic. I did another one. I know a lot of you guys are interested in, in tech companies, SaaS software. So here's an example more on like the uh, technology side. So pre-launch development, nine months development until we're actually releasing our first product. What is that based on? We actually got quotes for a scope of work that said it's going to be 10,000 hours and the hourly rate for a developer in North America is $200 per hour. Therefore, this is the period of time as well as the launch cost that we need to cover. Again, because you have quotes, because you have industry data, that is a defendable assumption. <clears throat> um, pricing, monthly installs, churn rates, these are all stats that you can pull from the industry, industry um, I guess, resources. So the average churn rate based on a user to churn ratio, uh, average wages for a developer, for a UX designer, you can get from industry data, uh, from HR sites, all that kind of stuff. Um, seasonality. I know for Bold, one of our biggest seasons is right before Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So we actually have a massive spike in revenue. And then after that, we go into Christmas and then things are a little slower for the next couple months. And then we wrap it up again. So it's showing that seasonality and that cash flow around our seasonality is important. So that's another example. Okay. How am I doing for time? Not great. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little rambly today. Uh, I won't get into this too much, but these are the key statements that you guys need to do. And these are the things that I think would be really great for you guys if you're serious about doing financial forecasting to meet with someone like Corinne who has a background in building financial statements. So um, they're complex, they're intertwined, but they can be simplified and they can be done using these assumptions. Um, so <clears throat> your P&L is your revenue, uh, variable costs and fixed costs. Your cash flow is like the money coming in and out of the business outside of your operations. So um, capital injections from investors, from the bank, to buy equipment, assets, that kind of stuff. And your balance sheet is simply just a record of the assets the company owns, the cash, the money that they expect to come in from clients, um, as well as liabilities. So money you own to the bank, any shareholder loans you have, uh, payables, et cetera. And then last is the shareholder's equity, which is the capital that's been invested into the company plus money that the company's retained uh, from operations. So again, this is something I didn't wanna go through in detail. Uh, you could do a whole entire uh, degree on this stuff, uh, but at the basic uh, level, um, this is where you wanna start. So I have pulled up um, a cool template uh, that Futurepreneur actually has built. So this is an awesome starting point. If you guys go to futurepreneur.com, uh, they have this for free. It's available. It comes with instructions on how to get started. Uh, it's all formulated. So if you type in some numbers, it'll tabulate at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> there's cash flows in here with instructions. So we'll make sure that you guys have access to this. Um, and it's a really good resource to get started. It's kind of a one size fits all. So if you're in a unique industry, um, you'll have to tweak it a little bit, but Crin can certainly help you with that. Uh, and then the last big thing is just present for your audience. So, I mean, the way you would present to a debt provider is very different than how you would present to an equity investor. Um, so uh, debt providers, you know, they want long form business plans, lots of detail. They've got a big checklist of things that they need to make sure is uh, done before that they can give you the money. Investors don't. They want it short and sweet. They want to know how you're going to make money. Is it going to work and how they can get a return on their investment? Forecast term for debt providers, typically three to five years. Um, equity investors, especially in like spaces like software, know that things are going to change dramatically between years two and on. Uh, so they typically like shorter form and summaries. Um, 
all this other stuff is pretty basic, but again, I want to just highlight the very last one, which is their motivation. So keep in mind, debt providers, they are here to mitigate risk. All they want is for you to make the payments back plus their interest. Investors are more focused on ROI. How are you going to take their $1,000 investment and turn it into a $2,000 and turn that $2,000 into a $4,000, et cetera? Um, so when you're writing your business plan, when you're writing your financial forecast, keep your audience in mind. I don't think it works to use the same business plan you did for your bank as it, for a venture capitalist. You need to have a different approach and a different uh, look on it. And then real quickly, do's and don'ts. I think with if you're using defendable assumptions, be aggressive in your projections, especially when you're talking to VCs. Banks, you can be a little bit more conservative, but if you can defend your numbers, I always suggest being aggressive. Show what you can do. And if you're garnering their trust through defendable assumptions, uh, they'll appreciate that you're being aggressive and you want to be successful. Number two, uh, goes without saying, but source all your work. If you're doing a business plan, I always have a whole page on assumptions with links to reports and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're doing a slide deck or a pitch deck for a VC, I usually build out at, at the end behind the presentation as many slides as I can um, in the appendix. So if they say, how did you get that growth rate? You can slide all the way to the back and pull that slide up. Uh, they really like to see that you've done your homework. Um, and then, yeah, know your numbers inside and out. Uh, that's how you gain trust with VCs and banks when they ask you a question. I see so many entrepreneurs will outsource this and get a friend or an accountant to do their projections. Then they sit in those meetings and just get hammered because they don't have any answers to the questions. And a VC is not going to accept that. Oh, my accountant, my accountant did that. Don't, this is a personal one, don't get projection ranges. I know a lot of people like the worst case, likely case, best case. Every VC and every banker I know, what they do is they just take the worst case and they usually haircut it and be like, okay, well, this is like maybe what we can expect. If you're confident in your numbers and they're defendable through assumptions, give what you think you're capable of doing and that's the case. Not giving a range, it doesn't show confidence and it doesn't show that you can't have an assumption set for every single case. Um, Number two, I think is maybe one of the most important ones, more of a business plan thing, but if you mention a cost in your business plan or your slide deck, make sure it's shown up in the financials. I see so many times people do a marketing section and we're going to do Google ads and we're going to have a billboard, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you get to the financial section, there's no mention of those Google ads. There's no mention of that billboard. And so the investors go, oh, well, if they forgot that cost, those costs that they mentioned in the business plan, what other costs have they forgotten in the financial projections? So uh, if you mention in the business plan, incorporating costs, any marketing equipment, make sure it's reflected in your financials. And then the last one is don't guess. I see so many times entrepreneurs get asked a question and they don't know the answer and they just swing for the hills. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't, uh, but super important not to guess. If you don't know the answer, be transparent, say, you know what, I actually didn't think about that. Let me get back to you. Or, hey, this is just an assumption, but I believe it's X, Y, and Z. Let me follow up with you. They'll appreciate that and it'll give you so much, so much more credibility than just taking a swing and hoping that you got it. Oh, that's it. My apologies for burning through that last half. I did not realize the time. I want to make sure I answer your guys' questions. So anything goes. And if I don't know, I won't guess. I will just tell you. And I'll pass it to you, Corinne. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much for this insightful presentation. I mean, if you don't get your financial projection right after this, I don't know. I mean, you can always come see me. So I'm just going to start with the first question. I'm just going to quickly scroll through here. Okay, so my first, the first question I have here, it, what is the common or reasonable percentage to ask equity for seed or for A series startups? What is the common or reasonable percentage? Reasonable percentage to ask uh, like a VC investor when we, when we do the, when we're doing the pitch. I think that's highly dependent uh, on the company, on the industry. I mean, industry has different standards. Um, it depends on the valuation and, and that kind of stuff. So I know that's not a real answer, but in general, you typically want your series A to give up a smaller percentage, because if you have intentions on doing a series B, C, D, mm -hmm. you want to make sure there's, you own a percentage still, 
big enough that you can do those future rounds. So I've seen in a lot of cases where people will give up 50, 60% of their company because they want to bring on the strategic investor. Well, that's great. But when they come to do their series B, they don't have much equity left to give away. And if they can't convince that series A investor to give money away uh, on their behalf, you know, you're kind of, you're stuck. Um, so I would say that's, it's dependent on the industry, it's dependent on your valuation, but in general, because you mentioned series A here, you want to keep it as lean as you can just get as enough cash as you can to get you to your next milestone and then do your next raise. Yeah, that's perfect. I hope this answered the question pretty well. Um, second question, international students aren't allowed to apply for a loan. What are the other options? Uh, I'll be transparent in saying I'm, I don't know. I don't know um, if you can't apply for a loan. I'm not sure if you're legally allowed to incorporate as an international student. If you can't, then you probably can't sell shares in a corporation. Um, so that would be a challenging scenario. Um, I would recommend you talk to um, uh, the Manitoba Corporation's office. They may be able to guide you a bit, but uh, that's a more of a legal question. I don't know. And I, I know you've also mentioned bootstrapping. So that may be something that they can be interested to, to just utilize their current um, uh, resources that they have and try to see if they can run with that. Totally. Uh, the third question, question, what funding source is preferable for a medical-based software? Uh, yeah, so I think someone has a very precise question. Uh, medical-based software? Mm -hmm. I think, um, again, highly dependent. I don't know much about your project, but uh, most software companies uh, have a long time between when you start and the development phase to being ready to launch. And banks typically shy away from that because, you know, if you're going to need a year or two with no income to build this thing, how are you going to make their monthly payments back? How are you going to pay those interest payments and those and those return payments? So typically you would be looking at something more on the equity side, investors or grant programs. I know anything in the medical space, there's a lot of opportunities for grants, um, but typically it would be on the equity side. And that further to that question, well, I guess you say software. So a lot of medical industry stuff have like FDA testing and a lot, so that makes that runway even longer. Um, but again, grants and, uh, and equity would probably be the best route. Okay, perfect. I have another one. What is the difference between crowdfunding and a GoFundMe? Um, there's, not, there's no difference. So there are different types of crowdfunding. Or well, so there's multiple types of crowdfunding. There's reward-based where you give money and in exchange you get a product. So that's like your Kickstarters, your Indiegogos. Um, there's equity based, so that's like WeFunder or Start Engine, where you give cash and then in return you get a piece of ownership in the company. GoFundMe is in the donation space, uh, so donations, crowdfunding, which is essentially you're just making a donation, um, so you're not actually getting anything in return. So GoFundMe is a form of crowdfunding. Okay, perfect. And there's another question that you answered already, and yeah, we have a lot of positive feedbacks. And uh, even myself, like this was amazing. This is brilliant, uh, Crystal. Thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge with us. And um, I don't know if there's any more questions. Maybe one last question. <clears throat> How, okay, we're gonna take that last question. How would you present to a crowdfunding audience? Like, I mean, is it a pitch pitching to a crowdfunding audience? Yeah, so, so most crowdfunding uh, takes place through crowdfunding platforms. So it depends on which way you want to do. If you want to do equity crowdfunding, there's some really popular platforms, WeFunder, Start Engine. I think the most popular one in Canada is called FrontFunder. And uh, basically what you do is you, base, you build a business plan, you do a video, you do some marketing material, and then you can upload it on their website. Um, there, on the equity side, there's a little bit more um, on the legal side you have to do. Um, you have to have a corporation and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, you go through one of these platforms. So Kickstarter and Indiegogo are the two that I deal with the most. Those are rewards based. So um, if you give me $10, I will ship you product X at a discount, essentially. Um, so those are the most common ones that you see uh, that are easy to get onto Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, but yeah, there's debt ones, lender, uh, lender club, funding circle, 
uh, yeah, you can raise pretty much any type of funding from the crowdfunding uh, through these platforms. And they all, if you go on there, you can see an example of what you would need. So um, marketing materials, shipping costs, you usually have to show them all these types of things. So go check out those platforms and see what other companies are doing. And that'll give you an idea for what you need to do to get on crowdfunding. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Fiso, again for for um, hosting this webinar and presenting. And we are going to uh, resume for today. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, again, you can go on the website and register for our upcoming webinars. Um, have a great afternoon. And if you have any questions, I'm here. You can book a meeting with me. As Crystal says, financials can be a little bit tricky and overwhelming. So I would love to to help you with that. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Christos, and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.